I'm here at Shakespeare and Company on Paris's left bank to meet Lionel Shriver, the award-winning author of The Mandibles. Let's go. Lionel Shriver is an American journalist and writer who's best known for her novel, We Need to Talk About Kevin. The book about a high school massacre took home the Orange Prize for Fiction in 2005. It was also adapted into a critically acclaimed film starring Tilda Swinton. Just because you're used to something doesn't mean you like it. You're used to me. Shriver's latest work, The Mandibles, is a dystopian tale about family, money and survival. Lionel Shriver, thank you very much for joining us on Encore today. My pleasure. Now, The Mandibles, mm -hmm. a family, 2029 to 2047. It's a novel uh, about several generations of one family uh, surviving amidst a global economic uh, crisis. It paints a very grim picture of a not too distant future. Tell us more about, uh, about the story. Well, it's a tale in which the US president in 2029 defaults on the American national debt. So, uh, you know, we borrowed all this money and we're not gonna pay it back. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, <laughs> except it has consequences. So that uh, when you default on your debts, other people don't want to loan your money anymore. Mm. So in order to uh, uh, pay its bills, the government starts printing money. And that leads to runaway inflation. And uh, uh, along the way, the stock market collapses. I have the US implode, and it doesn't take the rest of the world with it. And that's just because, um, honestly, I wasn't up for writing about the end of the world. <laughs> just the end of the U.S. Or at least, I would say, the humbling of the mm. U.S. Did you have a crystal ball when you were writing this? Because uh, the book just cuts very close uh, to the bone. Mexico uh, put up an electronic border fence to keep out American refugees, which, you know, evokes uh, one of uh, the U.S. President uh, Donald Trump's campaign promises, the USA uh, became a, a pariah nation. One of the weird things is that this book was completed in 2014, and um, Trump had not even started his campaign for president. So I figure he obviously um, took his platform from me. Um, though he, there he is stole a, your ideas? He stole my ideas, <laughs> though he obviously didn't get the point of the fence. Uh, you know, the, uh, Mexico does pay for it, but that's only because there are all these unemployed Americans that they want to keep the out. Mexicans want to keep that's the Americans right. out, right. It's futuristic yet realistic because in the book, newspapers have disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, books, I'm afraid books, that's all too realistic. Right, uh, books have disappeared, the euro has been scrapped, a coalition of countries led by Russia's Vladimir Putin is calling the shots. Um, is this a warning? Should we be scared? I tried to make uh, the economic part of the plot uh, as plausible as possible. Uh, so uh, there actually has been discussion about replacing the dollar with a different uh, international currency. The U.S. has been getting away with murder. I mean, why, why is the dollar reigning supreme, especially considering the size of our national debt? Uh, the idea that that money will never be paid back is uh, entirely credible. As I said earlier, it's a, it's a very dark vision of the world. Is there a moral to the story? I only learned the moral to my own story uh, from someone in the audience of one of my events. Uh, she pointed out that she, what she took away from the book was to appreciate how good we've got it now. And I think, I think she's right, that that's the, that's the best thing to, to derive from the book, that right now anyway, uh, we do have functional currencies. The economy has not collapsed. You can still buy a loaf of bread. It won't be that much more expensive tomorrow. Uh, it's still safe to walk down most streets. We still live in a civilized world. What brought the spending issue to a head was a delivery truck from Astor Wines and Spirits. Returning from work, Florence recognized its logo at 10 paces and something snapped. What is this? Florence exploded on the sidewalk while the poor deliveryman was still getting a signature in the basement stairwell. Stocking up on necessities. 
Avery, Avery said tersely as the man scuttled to his van. Toothpaste is a necessity, Florence spat. Not a tart, surprisingly supple Cabernet Shiraz. One of the characters in the book says, I don't follow all that economics drear. Now, what would you say to a potential reader uh, with the same attitude if you're trying to convince them to read a story based on an economic uh, dystopia? More uh, uh, culturally appealing word for economics is money, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and we all and care about it, money, right. <laughs> right? So the truth is that money is a very emotional subject. Uh, people have uh, passionate relationships to their capital, no matter how small an amount that you have saved. This is about the experience of people essentially being robbed on a massive scale. That's not just an academic story, um, and it's not all about theory. It, it, is, uh, it is about feeling. I have to confess I did not finish reading it. I found it very difficult, too depressing. Maybe it scared me that the reality could be a little bit too close to the dystopian life that she's painting in this book. We're particularly interested at this time because of the political climate in the United States. It's a very frightening time for us. Let's talk politics. So obviously Donald Trump has been elected, his administration uh, is now rocked by scandal. And again, your book, I think, mirrors reality because in it the Republicans have become a laughing stock. So yes, how, true. so how do you feel about where your uh, where your country is now? I think my country is is getting ahead of itself in terms of my plot. You know, this is not supposed to happen for another thirteen years or something. And uh, and you know, that's one of the problems with writing fiction, is that the reality can get away with you, that it can get ahead of you. And uh, I don't feel completely overtaken by events, but it is starting to feel eerie. Now, when the mandibles came out, there was um, some criticism of um, your depiction of the only African-American character mm -hmm. in the book, Luella. She was kept tied up either to her chair or on a short leash, anchored to a table leg, etc., etc. Um, so you may not agree with the backlash uh, surrounding the character, but can you see why it pushed some buttons? It was a deliberate taking a, a kind of snapshot out of context. After all, the character is not uh, being tied up for her own good because she's black. It's because she's demented. Mm. And uh, I was interested in looking at the uh, larger problem of uh, the so-called aging population, but trying to make it a lot more vivid. Now, there was um, some controversy when you spoke at the Brisbane Writers' Festival last year, dismissing cultural appropriation as a passing fad, part of a climate of super sensitivity. Now, you said that the last thing that fiction writers need mm -hmm. uh, is restriction on what, you, uh, what belongs to you, what you can and can't write about. If you are going to portray someone uh, who's very different from yourself, yeah, I definitely recommend uh, getting to know someone like that. That's just being a responsible, good fiction writer. Um, so I'm all for sensitivity. What I'm not for is uh, ownership uh, and, and exclusive ownership. I don't think that you own your own culture. Um, in, in a weird way, you don't even own yourself because you are part of other people's experience. I also think the whole impulse to say you can't, you can't write characters that are, that are like me. You can only write characters like you. I mean, it's, it's antithetical to the spirit of fiction. It's ungenerous. I think we should all be reaching out to each other and trying to imagine what people different from ourselves are like and what their experience is, and it's one of the things that fiction is good for. Your previous works, uh, your previous novels, have touched on uh, teenage violence, the U.S. healthcare system, obesity. Uh, do you seek out flashpoint issues uh, to provoke debate, or where do you get your inspiration from? I don't purposefully look for red button issues and, you know, what I want to find something that's going to get a lot of reaction. I'm really looking for something that I react to. And sometimes that turns out to be something that other people react to, too. But I just go by what, what's biting my bum, as they'd say in the UK. <laughs> uh, you know, when I wrote about obesity, I had a reason. Um, I had not too long before lost my older brother uh, 
to the complications of morbid obesity. And it gave me a sense of access to that experience that I, I don't think I would have had otherwise. And, and it, it, it meant I had strong feelings you know, about, about this issue and that were, that were complicated. It wasn't just uh, standing on the sidelines primly saying, well, you know, everyone should really lose weight, you know. Oh, you should go to the gym. Um, be more disciplined. It's not like, it wasn't like mm -hmm. that at all. It was, my brother broke my heart mm -hmm. and, uh, and I hated the way that other people treated him. And he was, he tested as a, as, as a genius, right? Which I resented as a kid. But later, <laughs> I became very but, proud of yeah, him. Yeah, of course. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, it, and it upset me mm -hmm. to see people treat him like some fat guy. Yeah. You know, so that seemed like a natural issue for me. Thank you so much. Uh, Th thanks so much for talking us. to Thank me. I enjoyed time. it. Yeah.